And the peace of the Lord be with you. And good morning and welcome to everyone. Um, I do have a, a couple of announcements before we begin. Uh, you know, obviously tomorrow is Memorial Day, so happy Memorial Day to everyone. And, uh, and, and just uh, as a reminder, the church office will be closed tomorrow. So, um, and then Tara will be back in the office on, on Tuesday. I'll actually be out of the office this week. I'll be back in June 7th, which is, is that right? The following Friday. I'll be in Friday and Saturday. You know, ordinarily I take Friday and Saturday off, but I'll be shifting my days off. Uh, so I'll be back in on, on Friday, June 7th. Um, but Tara will be in the office both this week and next week. If you need anything, I'll be getting the newsletter out and all that this week as well. So, um, Since I won't be here next Sunday, just a reminder, there will be a voters meeting on June 9th. You'll see that on the, on the calendar. And, uh, and that will also be the start of our, our monthly coffee hour. So we, you know, we've, kind of, we've been doing the, the coffee hours in the, um, in the summers. And unfortunately, we kind of just had the same people that end up having to do them week after week. So we decided we're going to do it once a month, and then we'll lighten, lighten the load on those a little bit. So we're going to do our, our first summer coffee hour on that day, on June 9th. And, um, and the sign-up sheet will be on the kitchen counter for that. So hopefully you'll be able to stay and, and join us for that. Uh, please sign up if you're interested in, in helping to bring food and, and whatnot for that. Uh, also, that same Sunday is script collection, so, so bring your script collections that day. And then lastly, the um, summer book discussion is a book called Jesus Said What? And it's about the hard sayings of Jesus. I, that, you'll see that from my newsletter article as well. Um, but they, we've already ordered a few. We, we, we got a, a bulk discount by getting, I think, 10 or something like that. So we've ordered a few. There, You, you can sign up for those, and we'll make sure you get the, those copies. And um, each copy is, is $12. So you can, there's also an envelope where you can leave the money for that. So we invite you to join us for that. If we run out, don't worry. We can get more. So please feel free to sign up. Don't worry that you have to be like the first 10 to get, to get a book. We can definitely get more. It's just that we got that, that discount for those. So please, please sign up for that. Um, as you'll see in the newsletter, the first, um, the first meeting that we'll have for that, usually we do those on Wednesdays, but the first meeting that we have for that will be on, on that, Monday, that last Monday of June. I'm out the rest of that week with the youth conference, taking youth to the, to the youth conference, so uh, the Higher Things Youth Conference. So we're going to do that Monday night, June, I think it's 24th, but we'll have plenty of time between now and then. You'll see, see that on the calendar, but we do invite you to join us for that. It should be, a, should be an interesting read. So... Um, with all that, our opening hymn this morning as we celebrate the, the Feast of the Holy Trinity, so today we, we honor God as, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our, our opening hymn is hymn 905, Come Thou Almighty King, hymn 905, and we will sing that after the pealing of the bells.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. O oh, Almighty and Merciful God, confess uh, that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Mighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as King forever. May the Lord give strength to His people. May the Lord bless His people with peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen.
Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship the unity in the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for this, the festival of the Holy Trinity, is from the sixth chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, This has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. 
Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies of your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for our Lord's words in the Holy Gospel. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, Alleluia. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated for our hymn of the day, hymn 947. All glory be to God on high, hymn 947.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning we meditate on this triune God. Would you ever try to picture what God looks like? I think it's kind of a common thing to do that, right? And to be sure, we get some, you could say maybe discourage about, discouragement about doing it by the places in the Bible that tell us things like that no one can see God and live. Or, or, or for example, we see Moses asking to see God's glory in Exodus 33. And, and, and the Lord tells Moses that no one can see his face and live, right? Although, of course, we do see that Moses is permitted to see his backside, for what it's worth. We also see in the New Testament, though, though, that God is explicitly described as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So as we're celebrating the Trinity this week, we can't forget that factor, too, right? God is one. He is one, and so we can speak of Him as one. But we also see, then, that He has three persons. Of course, how does that work? Well, I think you all know my technical term for that by now. Oh. It's a mystery, right? And it's a mystery that gets to the very core of the nature and essence of God. So suffice it to say that we'll figure out exactly how it works when we see him face to face, but that we're left in the meantime with this inability to picture God, aren't we? And so, as we reflect on that, then we can come to the Old Testament reading for today. And what do we have in that lesson? Well, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this is the, the call of Isaiah to be a prophet. Now, the, the, the explicit call, I'll t- talk about this here in a second, the explicit call happens right after what we read this morning, but this is, this is Isaiah in the throne room of God, right? God has given him a vision. And what is that vision? Well, it's actually a very Old Testament picture of God as we see that. And what do I mean by that? Well, to be clear, I do not mean that we should have some sort of image of God being different in the Old Testament in comparison to the New, right? We can, we can sort of get this idea that there's this change about God between the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? Right? Uh, For example, the most common misconception is probably that the God of the Old Testament is angry and the God of the New Testament is loving. That's not the case, right? You see cases of God in the New Testament speaking of bringing judgment, and you see cases in the Old Testament of God expressing his love for his people, right? But as we have that mindset, that can be problematic. It can make us think that somehow the Old Testament really doesn't have anything to tell us about God. It can make us think that whatever revelation we see about God in the Old Testament is, is unnecessary or inapplicable now. And that's not right. We need to understand that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The differences that we see then actually come down more so to what God required of His people under the law of Moses and what it means for us to be freed from that law. And with that in mind, then we should keep in mind what I always say, which is that the Old Testament is the context for the New Testament and the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old. So, with all that said, what do I mean that we have an Old Testament picture of God then in Isaiah chapter 6. Well, what I mean is that the trappings that we see in this vision are very consistent with what we see in the Old Testament. In particular, what I mean is that the picture that we see taking place in Isaiah 6 takes place with obvious references to the Old Testament temple in particular. But as we think about God in the context of the Old Testament temple... Do you know what the New Testament letter to the Hebrews tells us about that Old Testament temple? It tells us that that actually is a copy of the heavenly temple. 
In other words, it tells us that where God dwells in heaven somehow looks akin to what we see in the Old Testament temple. And so that in the end, this is all about God. Right? And actually, as a quick side note, we, you can kind of see in the historic structure of sanctuaries that there's a reflection of some of what you see in the Old Testament temple. You get the altar that's the, akin to the Holy of Holies, and then you get the, the outward motion from that altar. So just to kind of, a, 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 like I said, a side note. But any, anyway, having, having said that, what then do we see about this picture of God in Isaiah 6? Well, to start, I would say that we see the majesty of God and the worthiness of God to be worshipped. Right? Listen again to what Isaiah says there. He says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two He covered His face. With two He covered His feet. And with two He flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of Him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. As I said that we see this majesty and worthiness there. What, what do we, where do we see that in this passage? Well, first we see the, the throne and the robe, right? And what does it say? It says, God was sitting on the throne. Of course, a throne is an obvious picture of majesty. You think of a king with that. He was sitting on his throne and the robes filled the temple. Now, as I just mentioned a minute ago, the, the temple had at its center the Holy of Holies. That was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And if I could make the same comment I always do, you know, the Indiana Jones, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark Ark, not, the, not Noah's Ark. But the Ark of the Covenant was kept in that Holy of Holies. Do you know what was on the cover of the Ark? Angels. Angels on the cover showing us that the Holy of Holies was the place where God was present. And what it meant is that the, the temple was sort of this portal to heaven. And so as the, the robe is filling the temple, it's showing that this sign of the majesty of God is coming out from heaven, and it's filling that place as He sits upon His throne. So we see His majesty and His worthiness to be worshipped there. And then what? Well, then we see it with the seraphim as well. Right? There they are, the seraphim, standing in the, these angels, right? If you don't realize that, seraphim are, are some kind of angel. And they're standing, it says, above God. Now, now as we hear that, you might be inclined to think, well, why are the angels above God? That doesn't make sense, does it? But where did we just say God was? He was sitting on a throne, right? So the angels standing above him is a sign that they're serving him. He is seated, and they're standing above him, serving him. And he's worthy of that service. But then look at what the angels are saying. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Worthiness in his holiness. And of course, you all know those words, right? Because we, we say them every week. Which, by the way, when we say them in, in setting three, which is the setting we, we probably do the most... We say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of Sabaoth, right? Sabaoth is, is not related to Sabbath. Often people say, what is that? Is that related to Sabbath? No, it's not, it's not related to Sabbath. It's the, the word that's translated here, hosts. Right? It's, a, it's a military term. And so you think of like the host of an army or that sort of thing. The, the Lord is the, the Lord of the, of the army of heaven, so to speak, or the, the hosts of heaven. And as he is the Lord of the, those hosts, he is holy. He's set apart. He's distinct. It's what that holiness means. In fact, with God, it relates in, per, in, in particular to Him being perfect. All of this makes Him worthy of praise. And then it says that He fills the earth with His glory. Well, well, he created everything. It's, it's created and it's, and it's full of His glory and it makes Him worthy of praise. In fact, I was just talking to to one of, our, one of those in attendance here this morning about, about seeing that in creation. You say, you look at creation, you say, how can people not recognize its createdness? It, it reflects that glory of God 
you know, the, the way that things function. Well, you know, over the course of time, this just accidentally happened that this thing would function properly in that way. No. Right? It reflects the glory of God. And as he has done this, it makes him worthy of praise. So this triune God, this thrice holy God, is worthy of praise and to be worshipped. And that's what we see in those words, and that's what we see the angels say. But then what do we see? Then we see the majesty of the thresholds shaking from his voice. He's so powerful that it's shaking the building. And think about it, the temple was made out of stone. It wasn't like, you know, when the cars drive by on Wolf Road and our house sometimes shakes because it's made of wood. It's stone. It's powerful. And then we see that the building was also filled, the house was filled with smoke. So what's that? Remember, I said this was an Old Testament picture? This is from that. Now we're going to come back to that here in a minute, but for now, let's stop there and stop with seeing the, the worthiness of God, and let's look at what else we see there. So what's that? Well, we've seen all this with the power and majesty of God, but now we see then Isaiah standing in that presence. And what does Isaiah say? He says, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth. And so we see the Holy God. The Holy God who brings everything around Him to awe and worship. And we see the worshiper there realizing that He is not worthy. Look at His words. Woe is me. I am unclean. You can see Him thinking, no one can see the face of God and and yet I've gotten close and it's not good for me. Right? Because He recognizes His sin. So there's this this majestic, holy God worthy of worship and the unholy, unworthy worshiper. But then what do we see? Well, then we see these servants of God who have been attending to God in in His needs. Needs, not that He has needs, right? But attending to God in His desires. And these servants address Isaiah's concern. Right? He jumps to being a sinner with unclean lips from a people of unclean lips. And what do the angels do? It says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Do you see it? There is the sin. And now it's atoned for. Now as I say this, there's a a specificity in this atonement because Isaiah is going to to preach the Word, right? I talked about that, how he'll be called here right after this passage. And this atonement is, in a sense, preparing him for that task. That, That is why the atonement touches on his lips, so that he can speak the Word of God clearly. But it's an atonement, right? But what we can see as we take a step back from that is that the worthy God makes the unworthy worshiper worthy by atonement. Now, a couple minutes ago, I said that we'd come back to the smoke, so let's do that here. Because you see, this language of atonement and the smoke, they go hand in hand with the day of Yom Kippur. I'm guessing you've all heard of the day of Yom Kippur. You likely see it on your calendars. I think it usually falls somewhere like in in September or maybe October, uh, but I think usually September. And what Yom Kippur is is the Day of Atonement. Now, as I say, it's, you see it on your calendars, that's because it's still observed, although it can't properly be observed because it requires the sacrifice of the goats, which you do at the temple. And obviously, with the temple not being in existence on earth, then Jews can't do that. But what would happen is on that Day of Atonement, the high priest would go right in front of the curtain. So I mentioned the Holy of Holies, where the ark is, and there was the curtain. That's the curtain that tore when Christ died, right? And you go right in front of that curtain, and there was an altar, an altar of incense. And he would burn incense on that altar, and he would take the smoke from that incense, and it would fill the Holy of Holies, right? And as it filled that space, you, could, you saw smoke there. Now, why the smoke? 
because that's where God was. It's a sign of God's presence. And so what we see is that there's this smoke on this day with Isaiah. There's, there's this smoke and there's this coal. And it, and it seems that the coal probably, it, it could have been from the big altar out front where they did the sacrifices outside of that, that building where the, where the, 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 the um, incense altar was, where the Ark of the Covenant was. But it seems like it's probably actually from that altar of incense. You see, as I mentioned, the high priest burning that there on the Day of Atonement, the priests actually would burn incense every day, morning and evening. That's where, what Zechariah was doing when, uh, when, when the angel Gabriel came to him and told him that he, would, he, and Sarah would, or excuse me, he and Elizabeth would be the parents to John the Baptist. But they would, that seems that that coal came from there. But in any case, as we say all this, as we're describing all this to get a picture of God, what can we say we see at this point? Well, we don't get the picture of a figure, per se, except perhaps, I guess, of one sitting on a throne with robes. But we don't really get that clarity beyond that. But we get some kind of picture, don't we? And what's that picture? We get the picture of the God who is worthy to be worshipped, making the unworthy worshippers worthy through atoning their, for their sins. Christians, this is the triune God. This is what He does. The Father so loves the world that He sends His Son into the world that whoever believes in that Son would not perish but have eternal life. The holy God enters into this unholy world out of His great love and He bears its sin on the cross to be its Savior. And then He sends His Spirit to the church to bring about the new birth of people, the new birth of water and the Spirit. And hopefully as I say that, you realize I'm I'm referencing the Gospel lesson, right? From John chapter 3. I'm referencing it because it's Trinitarian. We see it also, the Trinity, in the the the, the, um, the reading from Acts where, where Peter is preaching, which Peter is preaching, this is on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit has been given. And he's preaching on that day about, about Jesus sent by the Father, the Father who, who raised Jesus, that He would not see corruption, as it said. And that was an Old Testament quote, by the way, that He would not let His Holy One see corruption, the promise of Jesus coming. And then we know that Jesus ascended to the Father's right hand and the Spirit was sent on this day of this sermon. That's the work of God, right? The Holy God bringing His holiness through the redemption of His Son given by the Spirit. So let's shift that then to you, Christians. That's what the triune God should be to you. He is the one who is so holy and awesome that you shudder and are in awe of His presence. And yet, He is the one who has redeemed you. Atoned for your sins on the cross in His Son, Jesus. The one who now comes to you and brings you His holiness. You see, that's why we sing holy, holy, holy every divine service. We sing it because Just like Isaiah was in the presence of God in that holy throne room, the throne room comes to you now. That God meets you now in the coming of Jesus. The Spirit brings Jesus here through His Word preaching. The Word of preaching brings Jesus here to you through His body and blood in His supper. Jesus here. The Holy God here. That's why we have reverent worship. It reflects that holiness as we're talking about picturing God, this fills that picture. Yes, He's that holy God on the throne. But yes, He's the holy God revealed on the cross. He's the holy God revealing His cross to you through His Word, through His water, through wine. He is the holy God who is worthy of praise making who, you, His unworthy worshipers, worthy by atoning for your sin and making you holy. So you can picture Him in that way. The God on the cross. The God in the Word. The God in the water. The God in the bread and the wine. And now, we praise Him here because He has made us holy to do so. 
What an awesome God this is. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And I may this awesome God guard and keep you in faith in Him unto His everlasting salvation. Amen. Please rise as we join together in confessing our faith in the, in the Athanasian Creed, and we'll, we'll do this responsively. Uh, and as I do every year, just as a note to remind you, in, in the, um, the first verse, I guess you could say there, we have the comment that whoever desires to be saved must above all hold the Catholic faith. And just a reminder, the, the word Catholic means universal, right? So we're speaking of the, the universal church here, the universal Christian church. Um, you know, as we say that I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, and the Creed, it's the same idea. That actually was Catholic origi- originally, I believe, in the Catholic Church. But, uh, so we're not, we're not saying we believe in the, the Roman Catholic Church, per se. We're saying or the, we believe in, the, in the, the, the Christian faith. And the other part is that as we look at the end, it says that those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. And I always like to remind people that as we look at the judgment that we see in Matthew 25, when Jesus speaks to them, that they're still in that judgment, even though their works are examined, this is still a salvation by grace through faith, because without faith, our works are unholy, just like I was talking about today. It's by faith that we receive that atoning sacrifice of Christ, and our unholy works are made holy through that perfection in Christ. So uh, this is, we're, we're confessing nothing that we don't ordinarily confess as we say this. So with that, I'll begin. Whoever desires to be saved must above all hold the Catholic faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled will without doubt perish eternally. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substances. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. But the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is one. The glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated or three infinites, but one uncreated and one infinite. In the same way, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, the Holy Spirit almighty. And yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. And yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so also we are prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or lords. The Father is not made nor created nor begotten by any. The Son is neither made nor created but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten but proceeding. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity, none is before or after another, none is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that in all things, as has been stated above, the Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity is to be worshipped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus about the Trinity. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation the one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and He is man born from the substance of His mother in this age, perfect God and perfect man composed of a rational soul in human flesh, equal to the Father with respect to His divinity, less than the Father with respect to His humanity. Although He is God and man, He is not two, but one Christ. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, So God in man is one Christ, 
who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his kingdom all people will rise again with their bodies and give an account concerning their own deeds. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. We continue with prayer. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their need. Lord of hosts, your ways are inscrutable and your judgments unsearchable. Through your word, give us an ever-growing understanding of the depths of your riches, wisdom, and knowledge, that we may glorify you forever as you have made us worthy to do so, atoning for our sins in your Son, Jesus Christ, and making us holy by your Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, Matthew, our Synod President, Alan, our District President, Mark and Valdis, our Circuit Visitors, and our Pastors, have heard your voice calling them to be your servants. Grant them the Spirit that they may always say, Here am I, send me, to do whatever you ask. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, you sit enthroned as king forever. Bless Joseph J. and all who rule us in your stead with wisdom and understanding, that truth and justice may prevail in our land, and lawlessness may be kept at bay. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, we thank you for the many blessings you have bestowed upon this nation. Grant us a long memory to recall those who gave the full measure of devotion to our country's peace and security. Bring to mind the sacrifices of those who served faithfully until death in the protection of our freedom and the defense of our land. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, you give us homes and families to care for us in your love. Bless our homes in that love that they would be built on the rock of your word. Be also with all those in our homes celebrating your good gifts this week. Athy Ray, Drew, Samantha, Megan, and Marilyn and Gary, as well as all celebrating birthdays, anniversaries, and other joyous occasions. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, uphold all who suffer in our midst by your truth, that since you are at their right hand, they cannot be shaken. Gladden their hearts, cause their tongues to rejoice, and make their flesh dwell in hope. Lord, be with the hungry, the homeless, the unemployed and underemployed, the lonely, the mourning, the sick, and the sorrowing. And be with all of those listed in our bulletin. Mary Lee, Leslie, Therese, Sandy, Walt, Jim, Linda, Bob, CJ, Cheryl, Nancy and Kent, Jerry, Blake, John, Tina, Richard, John, Christine, Ken, Jerry, Cassie, Emily, Dave, Bruce, Joanne, Doris, Dan, Keely and her unborn child, the Cooey family, Chris, Steve, Eleanor, Kulaga and family, Allison, Rose and Rachel, Michael, John, Bruce, Rod, Lisa, Kathy, Ben, Benjamin, Frank, Dorothy, Tracy, Joyce, Karen, Levi, Linda, Jamie, and Leah, Jurgen, Caitlin, Regina, Bill, Kurt, Rose, Adam, Kimmy, Don and Gail, Judy and Kurt, Vanessa, Doris, Noah, Athey, JD, John, Jim and Pat, Joe, Paula, excuse me, uh, Paula and the Whitaker family, Nancy and Carly and Owen. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, take away our guilt and atone for our sin by touching our unclean lips with Christ's cleansing body and blood, that we may not be lost, but ad- abide in your holy presence forever. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us, for to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the offertory hymn found on page 12 of the bulletin. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will honor thee, my Lord. I will take the cup of salvation and will
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all th places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God who with your only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit are one God, one Lord. In the confession of the only true God, we worship the Trinity in person and the unity and substance of majesty co-equal. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and His kingdom which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when He was betrayed, took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and He gave it to His disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us Your body and blood to eat and to drink, You lead us to remember and confess Your holy cross and passion, Your blessed death, Your rest in the tomb, Your resurrection from the dead, Your ascension into heaven, and Your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in Your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Christ, take away Now thus the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul and the one true saving faith to life everlasting depart in peace. Amen. We continue with our post-communion hymn, Thank the Lord, found on page 17 of the bulletin. Thank the Lord and sing His praise Tell everyone what He has done Let all the 
us through the salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you Oh. 